Hey guys, it's Johnny. Welcome to episode 53 of the Travel Like a Boss podcast. I'm here with Chris Lobb. What's up, guys? Thanks for being here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about e-commerce, uh, conversions, copywriting, Costa Rica, <laughs> and all sorts of cool things. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Yeah. So let's start with uh, how we met, when and where we met. We met last year here in Chiang Mai, where Johnny has been based for a while. Um, met through some mutual friends. We were both doing the digital nomad thing. And I left for a while, was living with another digital nomad in Costa Rica, uh, surfing every day. And all of our friends, or all my friends from last year came back here to Chiang Mai. So I'm back here for a couple more months. It's, it's such a crazy year. And, and you're saying, I mean, okay, so we're going to get into how much Chiang Mai and, and the people uh, have changed since then. But let's talk about, a little about Costa Rica because I saw, I've seen some photos of your house there and it was insane. Yeah, Costa Rica was pretty awesome. It was a lot different than Chiang Mai as far as um, the overall scene and the attitudes of the people. It was definitely not as business friendly. Uh, no other digital nomads. None of the locals were doing anything with internet marketing or anything like that. But it was awesome. I, I like to surf. That's the main reason I convinced this other guy to go down there and get this house with me. Um, so yeah, we lived eight minutes from this awesome surfing spot. Could wake up at six in the morning, cruise down, surf, come back and work. We had this huge uh, three bedroom house in the rainforest, like overlooking the ocean in the rainforest. Uh, it was gigantic. I mean, the photo I saw, I think no, Ben did a, um, a video tour of the place and it was so freaking big. Yeah, it was uh, $875 a month total plus our utility. So it pretty much came, it was $1,000 a month, came down to 500 a person. And I don't know square footage or any of that, but it was a big house. Um, way more square footage than you could ever get in Chiang Mai for that price, unless you go way out of town. And a cool then. beach to surf at. Yeah, awesome beach to surf at. There were you know some backpacker hostels right there, some other young people. It was, uh, like I said, very different. The whole city is population 700. And this little town we were in was about population 300. So you pretty much knew everybody. I mean, there was two or three restaurants, two or three mini marts. Um, one or two bar, you know, like two or three bars, but uh, very, very different than anywhere I've ever lived before. It was small. Yeah. And how long were you there for? Um, we were there for four months. I had spent a lot of time there in 2012 and just fell in love with it. So I convinced this guy to go back and um, I know I will be going back. I don't know when, but um, yeah, this place is okay, special cool. to me. So you liked it enough yeah. where you're going to go back again? Yeah. Yeah. I could... That could be where I semi-retire, spend a couple nice. of years settling down once I'm done, kind of moving around and traveling. And I know a big reason why you went out there was for the surf. How does that compare to other places you surf? Um, Costa Rica is pretty good. They have the, not quite the best in the world. They're not quite up there with Indonesia and you know maybe South Africa and some of these other places, but they definitely have some very good surf spots. And if you get there during the right time of year, um, yeah, world class. They have a few, um, all these point oh. and some other ones that are so compared very to, high level. So like Orange County, Huntington Beach. Uh, it was a lot better. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I grew up down there and uh, yeah, Costa Rica is a lot better and the water is warmer. It's like bath water every day of the year. It's pretty amazing. So let's give a shout out to your roommate there, Ben Kruger <laughs> from, was it pod, podcast authority engine? Was that? Um, authority engine. Yes. Ben Kruger, big podcaster running his own podcast, uh, managing other people's podcasts, teaching people. And yeah. he's actually the one I went to advice for when I started my podcast. Mm -hmm. And the reason why uh, Chris mentioned that I, these mics look familiar is because, <laughs> um, Ben recommended it to me. They're there. They're the audio technica 2100s. If anyone ever <laughs> wants to check out their equipment for, um, actually, you know what, if you want to know, Everything I use to make these podcasts, if you go to Travel Like a Boss podcast under resources, there is a, a, a whole page uh, and it talks about the hosting service I use and basically how I set it all, set it all up. And a big part of that was because of Ben. So shout out to him. Yeah. What's up, Ben? We will, like we said, this community is very small. Ben's going to be here in about a week up here in Chiang Mai oh, after cool. this big digital nomad conference in Bangkok. So Ben, we'll see you soon. Get back up here. So, I mean, so here's the crazy part is, uh, so a year has passed. I, I know I haven't seen you in a while, but I didn't think it was a year. In my mind, I'm like, yeah, oh, yep. it must have been a couple of months. That's, yeah, one of the sad parts about getting older. The time is just flying by, and especially when you're busy working, running a business, or trying to launch a business. Yeah, the time just flies by. It's pretty crazy. But it's it's a good 
it's a good thing. I think a lot of people that when time flies by, you know, four years of life passes and nothing new has happened. If you ask them, like if I ask my friends back home, uh, what have you been up to? You know, where are you working now? You know, and they'll say, I'm at the same job still. Mm -hmm. uh, I moved into a different apartment, but, you know, kind of in the same city. Um, you know, they might have went on vacation, but it was for a week or, you know, maybe they went for three <laughs> days. They're still going to the same bar, the same nightclub. Uh, and not that much has changed. And when you ask other digital nomads, what have you been up to? The answer is almost always, oh, I just got back from Europe or Costa Rica. Or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely a lot of adventures in this community. Um, it is very, anybody who's done this type of thing, you go overseas for a long time and then you go back home. You just have a totally different perspective on the way of life. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people about this. One thing you realize is it's not for everybody. I mean, there's just some people who are comfortable being at home and people like us who just, you know, need to be constantly stimulated and doing new things and whatnot. But, um, yeah. And we're always trying new things, which is crazy. Like, even though when we don't really need to, <laughs> we kind of just do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just telling Johnny, I just went and got one of those big, fast motorcycles for the first time the other week. You know, I'd ridden scooters and little 150s, but uh, I took out one of these Honda CBR 500s, really fast kind of Asian motorcycle. Cool. Yeah. And that dangerous new addiction, that was really fun. <laughs> So, yeah, and you know it, that actually gave me the idea where I would like to rent one as well. Um, if it was just me on the bike, I, I would have a ton of fun and go kind of wild. <laughs> uh, but I think what what I would do instead is I would rent. I don't know if I rent a five hundred. I might rent a two fifty. I don't know. Maybe I get a five hundred. But uh, I would have my girlfriend in the back. I don't know how comfortable those sports bikes are with two people. Probably not. <laughs> nope. uh, so maybe we get a cruiser or something, and then take a nice trip, like a two hour, three hour drive up to like Chengdao or something, which we really enjoyed last time we went. Yeah, that's the way to do it. These, um, I had a passenger on the back and I talked to some other girls who'd run on the back and, uh, yeah, it's a tiny seat. You're jacked up really high. You know, you're, you're above the driver, you're jacked up in the back and these bikes are fast, you know, driving them in traffic in a city. It's like having a tiger on a leash. They just want to jump out every time you hit the gas. So, uh, yeah, being on the back is not too fun, but for a thousand baht a day, which is $33 in us. It is insane. I mean, yeah. it's like, I dare you guys to go to a, a Honda motorcycle dealer uh, in the US anywhere and say, hey, <laughs> hey I got 35 bucks. Uh, can I take one of your bikes out for a day? Yeah, just not happening. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. 30 something dollars to rent this beautiful bike for a day. <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about what other crazy things um, have, like what is the biggest change that you've seen between the people that you knew in Chiang Mai a year ago and the people now? Yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, so I left last July in 2013 and just got here um, a month ago, I guess, middle of September, 2014. And a lot has changed. Um, there, was, there was a lot of people here last year, but almost nothing compared to this year. I mean, there's just Westerners everywhere here. Um, ton of people doing this e-commerce dropshipping stuff. A lot of people doing internet marketing of different kinds. There's more girls getting involved in the community. Um, so the, yeah, there's a lot of Westerners here, but everybody's kind of stepped it up a level. Um, a lot of people were kind of living on the cheap last year and just, you know, trying to get by and get their businesses off the ground. Um, and since I've come back, you know, pretty much all my friends that were here last year came back and everybody's just stepped it up a level. Everybody's further along in their business, making more money. And I really do think, you know, I know that that comes from being surrounded by other digital nomads. They're doing the same thing. Just when you're constantly surrounded by people that are working every day and launching new businesses and working really hard, it just, it rubs off on you. It just has a positive impact. I almost feel like 100% of the people that I know out here are doing better with their businesses now than they were a year ago. Everybody. Uh, and by yeah. better, I mean quite a bit better. Yeah. Uh, but do you think that's, I mean, what, like, do you think that really is everyone? Or do you think a lot of people dropped off the face of the earth and we just forgot about them or they moved back home? Because it almost seems like I can't even really think of anyone off the top of my head who gave up yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, there were a very small number of people that just didn't want to come back to Chiang Mai. But um, no, I mean, I think literally every single person that was part of our kind of, you know, extended social circle last year is back and they're all doing better than they were last year. So. And why do you think yeah. everyone comes back to Chiang Mai in particular? <laughs> uh, that's a funny question because I actually was not planning on coming back. 
but um, it, I don't, yeah, it's just, you can have such a high quality of living for so little money. And I think it's just when you know that, you, you know, you had a positive, you had a good time here last year. It made a positive impact on your business being around other people doing the same thing. So when everybody found out that kind of the core group of people were coming back here or had never left, <laughs> it just had that butterfly effect. I mean, I wasn't going to come back, but when I found out all my friends were going to be here, it's like, all right, well, I'll do a couple more months there. Why not? Well, I know, I know but, a lot of people were trying to sway their friends to check out a new place. They're like, you know, not, you know, we've done checking my, let's check out. I think they were trying to make, was it Deval? No, no. Uh, what's the place in, it wasn't Vietnam, it was the Philippines or there's a, like a, a city that a bunch of digital mads were, Duval, was yeah. it Duval? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, people have, you know, Saigon and Chiang Mai have basically become the number one and number two hubs. Um, by the way, if you're debating between the two, come to Chiang Mai. Saigon, <laughs> is, Saigon is not cool. We have a little bit of a rivalry going with them. But Did, um, Have you been there? Uh, not as a digital nomad. I've traveled through there. I really don't like the big, smoggy, dirty, congested cities. But um, yeah, some people are very stimulated by that, you know, just constant action, constantly being surrounded by that. So a lot of people do like it. But um, I think it's unfortunate. Uh, not that Chiang Mai is a bad place, but there are really no other big hubs have kind of popped up as far as other locations. And I really don't understand why or maybe this is just my personal preference, but I'm just waiting for a hub to pop up around a beach where there's a lot of surfing. <laughs> I know some digital nomads have tried in like Playa Carmen and Puerto Vallarta, but it just never caught on. The internet wasn't that great. You know, it just, um, you know, everybody loves Bali and people talk about it all the time, but the internet there still sucks. It's, you know, as soon as they get high, consistent high speed internet, it's game over. Everybody's going to be out there, but until then we're just waiting. You know, I would as much as I like Chiang Mai, I would like to see an alternative, uh, just in case for whatever reason. You know, I want to stop living in Thailand. Uh, we're very lucky that nothing bad happened from the the digital nomad raids or the core <laughs> space raids, and everyone's fine. You know, um, th there has been literally no problems ever since. If anything, people feel now, you know, now that the government basically knows what a digital nomad is, <laughs> and, and they've decided, hey, you know, I just leave them alone. That you know, they're just they're basically tourists checking their email. Um, uh, from from coffee shops and they're paying a lot of money to use this coffee shop we have no idea why they're paid to to, to work but yeah. they're paying to use the space it's it's pretty crazy and that just goes to show how big this community has become and how much of a movement kind of sprung out from four hour work week and this whole thing is i mean the thai government actually knows knows about us now they know you know what we're doing here they know how our businesses operate um, and they know that we're feeding the local economy. I mean, they've, they've, they've there are some hassles with the border runs and whatnot, but um, they've made it pretty darn easy for us to stay here, and we're supporting the local economy. So, um, and yeah, I it's... think they also know. Uh, there's been some people who've you know tried to push uh, business visas. They've been trying to push. Like there's one company that basically wants you to become an employee of theirs, have all of your clients paid them, and then they'll give you 80%, they'll take 20% and give you the 80% difference. Uh, and that way you can, you know, basically be a Thai business. Nobody wants to do that. <laughs> yeah. Like literally nobody <laughs> wants, I mean, it's not even about, it's about the money. First off, the principal, you're like, you want, what, you want me to give you 20% of everything I ever earn and you're going to, for what? And then second, they just don't want to deal with it. That's a pain in the ass. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lot easier for any of us to just pack our bag and say, I'm moving to Bali or I'm moving to Saigon than it is to, to go through that. And that's why no one's doing it. Yeah, I think as long as we can keep doing these border runs, even if it's a hassle to fly out of the country every two or three months, um, it, it's going to continue the way it is now. Yeah. I love it. So business-wise, what were you doing a year ago when you were first here? And then what, what have you been working on now? So, um, yeah, I mean, when I was here a year ago and hopefully people listening can learn from my mistakes, I, I really never, I didn't get started with this internet business stuff until last March. I had dabbled in make money online. Um, and actually like the very first, the very first things that I tested were successful and I really should have run with them, but I really got, um, shiny object syndrome and just started chasing every shiny object and, if something didn't work out, I bounced to something else a week later or a month later, and it really, really held me back. I should have just focused on 
one thing. I mean, I was trying to launch a PPC agency and then I was trying to do black hat SEO and just all this different stuff. And it really wasn't until I stopped and fo- focused on my core skills and really just focused on doing one thing that I started bringing in revenue um, and kind of saw a path forward. And I, I've still pivoted from there, but now I know that, you know, bouncing around and chasing shiny objects will get you nowhere. You know, just staying focused on your core skills and leveraging those is really the way to go. So the, so the things that you said were kind of a waste of time were PPC, which is pay-per-click advertising. Um, no, that wasn't, PPC wasn't a waste of time. It was the way that I approached it, just not being fully committed to it. Um, you know, I work on it for a month and then work on something else and then try to go back. Uh, you know, pay-per-click's a great business if you understand how search engines work. It was really just my, you know, me bouncing between different ideas, trying to launch. I don't even want to get into all the terrible okay. things, all the, <laughs> all the domains I bought, all the terrible ideas that I spent time on. But um, no, yeah, it was more, there's, you know, there's a million ways to make money with an online business. It's really just about staying focused and waking up every single day and just putting effort into it and adjusting based on feedback. So what was the first thing that actually brought in revenue and started working? <laughs> so you'll be able to relate to this. The very first thing I did, I'm pretty sure everybody who's ever backpack has done this, but I decided to become a travel blogger. And um, I was kind of looking at the landscape and networking with a lot of travel bloggers who I ended up meeting here in Chiang Mai. Uh, I don't know if you, I'm sure you knew this, but Chiang Mai was a hub even years ago before it became the digital nomad thing. It was the travel blogger hub. Oh, okay. So this place has been popular for a long time. But um, my very first, I still have the check. I wrote a travel guide about how to save money backpacking through Southeast Asia. And I started, that was like the very first sales letter that I ever wrote. I read Dan Kennedy's book, Ultimate Sales Letter, like wrote, I don't know, it was, it was ugly. The copy was probably terrible. But um, I was using my travel blog to promote it and a little bit of paid traffic. And I think I sold like 10 or 20 copies of this little travel guide. And uh, yeah, that was the start of nice. my okay. online money making ventures. And so let's say, so 20 copies at how much was each copy? I think like 10 bucks probably. Okay. So you're like, okay, I got made 200 bucks online. So I know it's possible. Uh, was, it probably wasn't the best use of your time because I'm sure you put a lot of hours into writing that, the, the blog and the book. Yeah, I, I realized pretty fast. Um, I was happy that I was making money, but I wasn't making a positive ROI. And I realized really fast that making money through travel blogging, you know, making any kind of legitimate income is extremely difficult. It's just, it's really hard to tap that market. Excuse me. So I branched out. I was listening to, I started listening to podcasts and I stumbled on Pat Flynn's Smart Income podcast. And search engines were my background. I worked at a big search engine marketing agency in Los Angeles for three and a half years. So I executed on that stuff and also started making money with that niche AdSense sites and affiliate income. And then Google rolled out, I think it was their Penguin update was where they started to get really aggressive, taking down websites that were doing SEO. And it just totally crippled me. I lost all my sites and all my income overnight. And um, I just moved into this apartment in Hawaii. I had bills to pay and all this stuff. So I had to kind of get into freelancing and I was working this job. Um, And it kind of went downhill from there for a while until I eventually realized how unhappy I was. And then I quit and moved to Chiang Mai and tried to figure out this whole business thing. It's crazy how many people I've met now who lived in Hawaii, which is kind of known <laughs> as you know paradise, right? And had, are now living in Chiang Mai. Yeah, Hawaii is pretty amazing, but it's a terrible place to run a business. Um, second, or where I was in Honolulu, Waikiki, at least second most expensive city in the U.S. after New York, and the taxes are very high. It's a very democratic, liberal state, so um, not a good place. It's the opposite of Chiang Mai. Just a terrible place to bootstrap a business. And so and I think Chiang Mai, what's really cool about it is it's growing to fit our needs. So mm-hmm. a year ago, uh, most of the combination was pretty basic and very cheap. That all is still around. So you could still get a place for $150 a month, mm-hmm. but they've been building so many luxury condos. Mm-hmm. It's insane. Yeah. They're popping up all over the place. And um, yeah, I mean, th- these options just like were not here last year and now there's a handful of really good ones and more coming on the way. It's You can have such a high quality of life here for so little money. I mean, if you're not stupid about drinking on the weekends, 
you can live in like a luxury condo, eat out for all your meals for thousand bucks a month, something like that. Yeah, it's just crazy. Yeah, so the place that I live now, so so we're in my new apartment, uh, and I, me and Larissa live here, so we split the cost of it, and it's like. 450 bucks a month or something like that it's, it's way less than 500 bucks a month so it's like 200 something per, per person and we are walking distance i mean we literally wa- you know can walk to every single restaurant we want to eat at to all the coffee shops all the bars we walk to pun space uh i've been showing you i'll show you after this but there's a nice swimming pool and there's a rooftop garden mm-hmm. and yeah. there's no way you can get this for you know no. 250 bucks per person <laughs> no i mean i've been when I was back in the U.S., I was living in the West Side L.A. in Santa Monica, and yeah, you can't even get a studio apartment out there for less than thirteen or fourteen hundred. I mean, my my total expenses here are less than rent where I would pay in Orange County or West L.A. or Hawaii. It's yeah, it's just crazy. So I think that that's why there's so many people that are living here. And um, what's crazy and that you mentioned earlier was the not just the digital nomad community, but the actual dropshipping community has blown up here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are. I just went to a meetup last night that James Bird uh, organized and was kind of pushing on Facebook. And I walked in and I saw James talking to a couple people, and I kind of laughed. I was like, "Oh, that's sad. Like nobody showed up for his little meetup because like twenty people RSVP'd on Facebook." Um, but there were two huge long tables full of people doing work, and I thought they were just a co-working space, like people there doing work. Turns out both tables were full of drop shipping people. There was literally like forty people there, all just networking, you know, asking questions, getting their questions answered. And yeah, it's just such a big, powerful community. Um, there's so many, you know, resources to get help from, and people in this community are so passionate about helping other people. It's just, it's awesome. Yeah, and the cool thing about it is, so um, there's a lot of online forums and communities for things like. Black Hat SEO or for these things. But uh, me and Chris had lunch earlier and he mentioned there's not that many communities that talk about e-commerce. And he was he was he asked me, why do you think that is? So there's the private member forums of things like Anton's course, but in general, there's not that many people talking about it. And I was saying, I think it's because it e-commerce works. And as soon as you actually start making money from it, you stop asking, you stop chasing the, the latest marketing trick. You can, you kind of just learn the basics and you're like, okay, have a good product, you know, have a decently designed store that is, that converts well. And you know, then you start kind of building it as a real business instead of going out trying to find, okay, what's the latest SEO trick to get more traffic? Yeah. I, I've been involved in SEO for a long time, pretty heavily focused on it the last year and a half or so, but yeah, with any business, there's going to be trial and error and you're going to have failures. But, you know, I really do love Anton's model, the drop shipping, the e-commerce stuff. Um, most people get it wrong their first time, but you learn so many lessons and it's so much easier the second time around. And it's just, it's a legitimate business. Whereas with this SEO stuff, it's just getting harder and harder. You know, we're working against some of the smartest computer scientists in the world, basically working over there at Google, um, and they're just making our lives more and more difficult. So, yeah, I, I definitely will be mo- more focused on the e-commerce stuff moving forward, which you and I talked about. So, one question that a, a few people on the blog, Johnny FD, uh, asked is, "What is the startup cost of basically opening a job shipping store?" Do, do you want to answer that one? Oh yeah, I mean, I'm working on launching my second store literally right now, and I have it all mapped out on a just a Word document. But I think um, for me to launch a 50 product store is going to cost somewhere around 250 to 300 dollars, and that's getting like a really really nice looking store, custom theme, forest theme, um, running it on WordPress, outsourcing pretty much all the work, so I'm not doing any of the manual labor. Yeah, two fifty, three hundred bucks, and I am ninety nine point nine percent confident I'll be making that back within the first couple of weeks, first, yeah, first you, week or two. What no made problem. you decide to uh, do it on WordPress and not on Shopify? Uh, I spent a lot of time debating it, and there are um, the few communities that do exist. There's a Facebook group, LinkedIn group, uh, a little bit on Warrior Forum, but you just have so much more control with WordPress. Uh, I spend a lot of my time studying direct response. So things like lead generation, capturing email addresses, being able to do retargeting, conversion tracking on the back end, conversion optimization. Um, 
all that stuff you can handle very easily through WordPress. And I, I've been doing, I've been operating SEO sites on WordPress for a long time, so I know it. But Shopify, you pretty much have to know coding, or you have to, you know, you have to have someone reliable working for you, a VA that can do coding. Um, and you're still limited. WordPress just has a million plugins for, you know, pop up boxes to capture email addresses and integrating with Cloudflare and doing all this stuff. So I just wanted that level of control. Um, yeah, it pretty much just came down to control and flexibility. I think a, a nice analogy would be you know, the iPhone versus an Android, mm-hmm. where Shopify to me is like iPhone, like iOS. It doesn't really allow you to do a lot of fancy stuff. There's only one podcast app on there. There's only one you know so and so app on there, mm-hmm. and. But it, you know, to me, it does enough. Like I'm like, okay, you know, what? I can't do this. Cr- you know, I can't have it pop up here, but I can have it do it here. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, while on Android or on WordPress, you can basically do whatever you want. Yeah. So I think for those people that really want to fine tune and spend the time to optimize the back end of it, uh, I, I would say, you know, what I can see why people want want WordPress. But for me, and I would say definitely for beginners that you know that don't want to <laughs> to learn WordPress. Just use Shopify. Yeah, definitely. And some of it was um, site speed and conversion. This was a big deciding point for me. With Shopify, you know, your site is being hosted on their servers, whereas with WordPress, you pick your own hosting. So I'm set up with WordPress kind of speed optimized hosting, um, and then I'm using CDNs and Cloudflare to really get that speed up. But yeah, site speed not only helps with SEO, but it has a big impact on conversions. You know, nobody likes a website that loads slow. Um, so the faster your site operates, the higher your conversions are going to be, and you're going to get that extra love from Google. So that was definitely a big thing. Is I wanted you know the fastest uh, loading site possible. Yeah, I can definitely see that, and I I do agree that if a site takes let's say ten seconds to load, you're going to lose a lot of customers because they're assume they're going to assume your site's broken or they might just forget and click off. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, it's it's the same for everybody. If a site takes too long to load, you just click and never go back. It's just not yeah. cool. But at the same time, if, if the difference is you know is three seconds versus three point four seconds, I don't uh, I I don't think that there's a big of a, a difference um, with <clears throat> you know with losing customers or conversion. And to me, Shopify is not the fastest thing in the world. I'm sure there's a lot faster, uh, but it's been fine. Like I've never actually had a complaint about it. So I kind of you know, and I almost kind of assume that if you're you know what they should do actually Shopify should have tiered plans where if the more money you're paying them or the more money you're making <laughs> they should just basically give you more bandwidth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of f- control freak about some of this stuff because I know it all, but yeah, if you're just getting started, you know, you don't have to worry about a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about. But a lot of things that you can control are things like your copy uh on your actual site itself and that's what Chris is focusing on now. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So this was something I was just talking to Johnny about at lunch. Um, uh, I don't, did you read Perry Marshall's eighty twenty book? I've heard of the rule, but I haven't read it. Okay. So uh, I definitely recommend the book. I'll send the link to you later. But uh, basically, this eighty twenty rule, uh, when you apply it to business, it says that eighty percent of your revenues are coming from twenty percent of what you offer, your products or your services or whatever. So if you have an e-commerce store and you're selling a hundred products, odds are eighty per twenty you know, eighty percent of your revenue is coming from twenty percent of your products. But this eighty twenty rule it's called fractal, but it basically there's eighty ten eighty twenty squared and eighty twenty cubed. And if you take it to that third level, it basically says that fifty percent of your revenues are coming from one percent or slightly below 1% of what you're offering. So what I'm working on right now, in addition to running my own store, which is almost more for case study purposes than income, is working with uh, e-commerce store owners and owners of high traffic Amazon and eBay pages to really help them optimize their high traffic pages. So if they have you know, a store selling 100 things, just look at the top two selling products that get the most traffic and really work on the sales copy, do conversion optimization. Um, There's surveys you can, post conversion surveys you can implement on the back end that I learned from a really advanced marketer, this uh, marketing PhD, used to do marketing consulting for Fortune 100 companies. Um, Really, really cool method that, you know, there's no tricks, it's all research-based, you get really good feedback, 
And then you basically just take the feedback and spoon feed it back to the visitors on your website, um, just writing copy about the hot button issues that you know make them buy. So that is a service that I you know, completely brand new. The website's not even live. It'll be going up this weekend. But um, I am will be working with store owners and was talking to Johnny. That's why we went to lunch today. I'm essentially looking for a few store owners that have high traffic product pages that um, want them optimized, that aren't happy with their conversions and want to get their conversions up. Just looking to build some case studies and show kind of how powerful it is and the difference in, you know, you take your top selling products, add an extra 20, 25% on there. Super easy win, super easy profit and revenue. So this is going to be a very cool offer to, to listeners. Uh, the qualifications are you have to have a store that's actually making sales ready. You know, it's, yeah. you can't optimize something that you know that isn't proven yet. So if you have some kind of e-commerce store, it can be Amazon, eBay, uh, a Shopify store, whatever it is, uh, and you ha- are selling products, uh, Chris will help you sell more. <laughs> yeah, basically the criteria is um, if it's Amazon or eBay, then we would just be doing the sales copy, uh, but you can still compare the conversion rates relative to traffic numbers. If you are on your own platform, WooCommerce, Shopify, whatever, then we can do both the copywriting and the conversion optimization. But yeah, basically if you have any single product that's getting about 75 or more conversions per month, Um, to the point where we can actually monitor statistically relevant differences in conversions, improvements, then, um, yeah, I am looking for a handful of people to do this for completely free, just basically building case studies. And in the end, you get a higher converting uh, store or product page. Yeah, so that is a very generous offer. Uh, No money up front and no money from the back end. Maybe just a thank you. (laughs) For a limited time. (laughs) Until I get two case studies under my belt, then I will definitely be charging. But... um, yeah, if anybody's listening, I'd be happy to talk to you. Very cool. So we'll leave um, Chris's email in the show notes. This is episode 53. Uh, and you can just email him there. And we'll have a link to his site when it goes up live as well. Uh, so what are some kind of quick tips for, for people that, you know, let's say they, you know, they're, they're not really making that many sales yet. But, you know, they do have a store. And they, they know, you know, like, like they know there's a couple products that should be selling. What are, what are usually the things that you want to look at first? There are... The kind of general stuff that every store owner should do is mainly just putting trust signals in place. You know, they're one thing that they talked about at Ryan Dice's Traffic and Conversion Summit this year was that it is now harder than ever before to get people to make that first sale, to get that first dollar. But once you make that first sale, it's easier than ever before to keep them in your funnel and continue selling to them. So basically what that's kind of saying is there's trust barriers. You know, people just don't trust spending money with people they don't know. So you want to put as many trust signals in place, having those, you know, hacker safe little logos at the bottom of your site, putting your phone number, responding to customer service emails right away. Um, anything, you know, putting a face on your website, you know, just versus having generic logos. If you can put your face on your about page, anything you can do to increase trust and show people that you're a real company, you're not going to disappear with their money. If they have any problems, you're going to handle it. That's stuff that any business, not just e-commerce, but any business can do. Um, and you'll be surprised how many businesses don't have any of that. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, If you have an e-commerce store and you're actually getting traffic and you're not happy with your conversions, then then you need to be more focused on the actual marketing side of it, which is going to be copywriting, you know, trying to make one of the things that a lot of people slack off on e-commerce is, you know, they're selling physical products, but you still have to remember that people buy things for emotional reasons. Excuse me. So... You really want to, you know, if you don't have the time to learn copywriting, you want to work with a professional copywriter who has a history and, you know, try to make your product descriptions and your headline as juicy as possible. You know, make them enticing, use direct response principles, make guarantees, you know, money back guarantees. There's no risk. Use testimonials, call to actions. Uh, you know, just studying direct response and incorporating basic direct response principles into your e-commerce stores can make a really big difference. And I 100% agree with everything you just said. Uh, starting with, you know, for for my stores, 
I would say more than 80% of my sales come from 20% of my products. Mm-hmm. Uh, and out of those 20% of products, there's a couple, you know, I would say a handful that make most of the sales as well. Mm-hmm. And those, I, I really do think that one of the big reasons why they sell so well is because I identified them very early on uh, by literally just asking my supplier, hey, what are your top sellers? Mm-hmm. And they said, yeah. oh, these three. And I was like, okay. So I spent hours on them, rewriting the copy myself, um, You know, make sure I had those, those tr- the trust there, the testimonials there, the guarantees there, call to actions there. You, you know, with basically all, everything I learned in basic internet marketing, but applying it to e-commerce, which I think is, there's a huge market for. And I'm glad you're providing the service now because a lot of people don't want to spend you know, days, months learning copywriting, they, you know, and they just want it done. Yeah, it's been really interesting. My, this is almost a brand new project and it's moved really, really fast. I'm working with a guy who is number one on Google right now for Amazon copywriting and he does copywriting for the product pages. And I did some sample writing to show him my skills and I went through and looked for Amazon products that I had bought in the past that just that I know sell, you know, thousands and thousands of units. They have like twenty five hundred reviews and stuff. And um, I just rewrote their sales pages and just like it wasn't that good. It just you know, you'd be surprised how few e commerce sellers are really using this copywriting and direct response stuff and it can make a really big difference. So um yeah, I, I'm really curious to see kind of how this plays out. I think there's a lot of people that could benefit from this. Yeah, so I've been researching uh, Amazon FBA, which is uh, fulfilled by Amazon. And basically what that is, is private labeling or importing your own products. Uh, and while doing my niche research to kind of see what products are selling well on Amazon that I can compete against, mm-hmm. I realized how many there are that have terrible descriptions, uh, you know, basically they just happen to be a product that people want. They mm-hmm. might have, you know, a decent photo and a like very short one line title, a three line description, and that's it. You know? Mm-hmm. And one of the big things is manufacturers or people that who, you know, make stuff or import, they might list the the features of a product, but they don't know how to list the benefits. Mm-hmm. And the and the key difference is as a customer I don't really care that much what your features are. I don't care if it's UL rated or ISO, you know, twenty six hundred. I want to know, get you know, I want to know is this product guaranteed to work? Are other customers using it and, and loving it? Is it you know uh, super lightweight? Is it easy to use? Is it you know kind of like these 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 benefits to me? Like what is why am I buying this? It's it's not because you listed. <clears throat> X and X number, it's because that number means something to me. Yeah, that's probably the biggest mistake in all, not just e-commerce, but all of internet marketing um, is just focusing on the wrong thing. You know, I've been writing for business coaches. I did a review of this wet shaving uh, double-edged safety razor thing. And yeah, their whole product description is focusing on double chrome plated and it looks fancy but as a man buying a razor, you don't care about any of that. All you care about is, is this going to give me razor burn? Is this going to cut my neck? So when I rewrote the sales page, that's what I focused on. I made it very emotional or you know, very pushing those hot buttons, focusing on razor burn and your neck's bleeding when you're done shaving and all, the, you know, all that stuff that we hate. Um, so yeah, that's just one small example. But yeah, you really have to look. Be, you know, nobody cares about the technology. All they care about is what they're going to get out of it, how the products, you know, yeah, just what they're going to get out of it. And that's why I think there's such a big market right now, especially selling on on Amazon, because they're they're huge. I mean, literally every single person I know in the U.S. buys almost exclusively on Amazon, mm-hmm. and there's still so many products. I actually was worried. The, one of the big reasons why I put this off for so long is I just assumed, without doing any research, I just assumed that you know I'm like, no, this is going to be Amazon's going to be saturated. There's probably tons of people doing what I want to do now, but I went on and within an hour we found tons of wide open product niches that you know i mean and and the easiest way just take a look around amazon just you know open that up right now while listening and just start browsing around and look at top sellers of each category and ask yourself are these descriptions good are these titles good you know do they have you know do they have um, benefits listed and if not could you do a better job importing a similar looking product uh, and writing a good copy? And if the answer is yes, then really look into uh, FBA, which is fulfilled by Amazon. And for those who don't know what that is, is basically you order something off of like Alibaba from China and 
Amazon stores it all. They warehouse it all and they take care of everything. So you list it on Amazon. So you don't even need a website. You list it on Amazon and they keep it in their warehouse. And when someone orders it, Amazon collects the money, they pack it, they ship it, and they handle the customer service. So if someone needs to return something or they want to know the tracking number, Amazon handles that. You don't handle any of it. They do take a big percentage of it. Um, you know, that's kind of their business model. And if your your item isn't selling, you're paying to, to keep your items in that warehouse. Uh, so that's why, you know, I'm kind of taking this uh, precautiously. I'm testing it right now. I just wrote a big blog post, a really like a mega post on my blog uh, called eBay, dropshipping from eBay to test <laughs> Amazon FBA. Um, and so I'm actually going through a course right now. I'm not going to recommend it yet live because I haven't you know, gone through the whole thing and made money from it yet. But it seems like so far it is, you know, it's exactly what I've been looking for to kind of hold my hand through the whole process. Um, and if you guys, you know, have followed my journey uh, or read Life Changes Quick, you guys would know that I'm a big fan of following courses that actually work. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, if it teaches me a legitimate way to build a business and make money, then to me, it's worth that initial investment. Yeah, I agree 100%. I was I spent a lot of time on Amazon looking at the products that I'm going to be selling on my next store, um, mainly to see if they were enforcing minimum, minimum advertised pricing, which I was happy to see that they were, which is a good signal if you're doing keyword research and exploring a niche. But kind of coming back to the trust thing that we said, I think you're going to be really happy with the results you see on Amazon because they have that trust. You know, people don't really look at the, you know, when you go to buy a product on Amazon, uh, you know, it's it's housed and it's shipped by Amazon, but it's being sold in 99% of, or I don't really know, but in a majority of cases, it's being sold by a business just like Johnny's or it's just being sold by a random business. It's just the, it's actually being sold on Amazon. But because it's Amazon, they have so much trust. You know, people feel comfortable buying from Amazon. They really don't care who the seller is. So I think if you go after the right market and, you know, you do nice looking pictures and you get your copyright, I think you're going to crush it on Amazon. It's definitely something I'll be doing in the future. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, ask like, why the heck are you doing this now? Uh, especially because my dropshipping stores are still doing very well. It's still basically all my income. Um, it's definitely, I, I definitely see it being my, the majority of my income for a long, long time. The only reason why I'm doing this Amazon FBA stuff now is because I've always wanted, my, my goal was always to make enough money with dropshipping, gain the e-commerce experience, let those stores still run in the background, uh, and start private labeling my own brands. So uh, the biggest difference though between Anton's course and the one I'm doing now is with Anton's, you want to pick very expensive items and mm -hmm. often very expensive items are heavy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, then the problem with that is if I need to order a minimum of 500 from China to warehouse in, uh, at Amazon, you know, 500 times a couple hundred bucks is going to be, mm -hmm. you know, tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, you know, I'm looking at, you know, spending $30,000 in one order uh, and then spending a lot of money to ship it because they're big and heavy and then spending a lot of money every month to warehouse it. While what I'm doing now, uh, this arbitrage stuff is basically you're, you're looking at very low price items that are very lightweight. So, you know, items that weigh less than two pounds that, you know, cost, you know, the, the price, you know, could be higher, but you know, it could be low price items as well. And that way my initial investment will be less than $10,000 and the shipping is going to be, you know, from China to Amazon in the US is going to be much lower. The warehouse is not much lower just because they're small items. Uh, but if it wasn't for drop shipping, there's no way I would have the confidence in e-commerce or the experience or even that $10,000 to really get started. Yeah, there's, I don't really have any experience with importing from China and, you know, having Amazon um, ship and fulfill all of that stuff. But the, the experience that you get from drop shipping and just the fact we were talking about this at lunch that if the real money in e-commerce is in offering your own product. It's not drop shipping. Um, it's offering your own product, ideally, where you're, you know, you are importing it from China and making big margins on it. Um, but one of kind of a four hour work week principle and just a good business principle in general is to test markets for as cheaply as possible and on a very small scale. And, you know, say you're operating a drop shipping furniture store and you're considering offering your own line of product, 
you can you know you can have the designs done and pre-sell it on your store or even just sell it and refund people's money and just kind of see you know what your conversion rates are going to be and you know how well you think it's going to sell before you commit that 10,000 or 30,000 to having them build it in China and then ship it over so it, whereas you know if you don't have a store and you don't have any experience with e-commerce you really can't do that so that will work in your favor definitely yeah so to answer um that the the blog comments uh initial question about how much it actually costs to set up a store in, in the first place uh kind of just off the top of my head uh shopify is 30 dollars a month to start uh, or you can go with a wordpress theme that's about 250 dollars or so all in all to set up um shopify is also free for the first two weeks so you get a trial on it so that's really nothing um you can make a logo off fiverr for five bucks you can register your business. Uh, if you're American, you can just register an EIN number and a tax ID number for free as well. Um, if you're from another country, uh, you know, just check to see how much it costs to, to register a business. But what I actually recommend people and what I did myself is just start as a sole proprietor. Just start under your own name, you know, and don't worry about all that until you start making money, until you start making a couple of thousand dollars a month and then look into getting an LLC. But in the beginning, just start as easy as possible. Uh, aside from that, you you're gonna need some money with the let's see by Skype number uh you know down, or you can use Grasshopper or something Maybe you might spend ten bucks a month on that the let's see what else is there the that some apps uh, I wouldn't pay for any apps in the beginning um just <laughs> basically just do that for free there's trust seals um those end up being you know thirty bucks a month but don't even sign up for those until you're converting if it's not paying you if you're not making money from your site yet you don't really need any of that stuff so. The only thing that you're really going to pay for is Shopify, a logo, and I would say uh, the advertising. And in the beginning, you can use all the free credits. So under my recommended resources page on Johnny FD, there's $75 in Amazon credits, there's $75 in Google credits, and you're probably going to run out of those pretty quick, uh, just to be honest. Uh, so what I would do is I would also put another, you know, budget another $75 um, of your own monies. So 150, uh, like maybe 100 or 150 dollars total, just so you kind of have a good idea if it's going to convert or not. Uh, and if it doesn't, if you don't make start making sales before that 100 dollars runs out, uh, then you know something's wrong. Um, so total startup costs, I would say 200 bucks plus 30 bucks a month. Yeah, it, it all depends how you do it. I'm outsourcing a lot of stuff, so I'm spending more. But you can definitely get started for not. I mean, you can literally. If you're writing your own product descriptions and stuff, I mean, you can get started for a hundred dollars, maybe. Uh, yeah, it's it's really not that much to get started. Um, but um, yeah, what has your experience been with the Amazon ads? Because my first try with it was not so great, and I didn't like how they forced a high cost per click based on the product of uh, based on the price of your product. Yeah, so in the beginning, I actually I ran out of my seventy five dollar credit pretty fast, but I think I was lucky enough. I made one or two sales from that, so I knew it worked. Mm. But I also knew, you know, I was bootstrapping. I had, you know, a couple hundred dollars in the bank, and I was like, I can't afford to to test it with, you know, um, I can't afford to spend three hundred dollars or five hundred dollars a month on these ads if I'm not making money back from it yet. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I think I paused my Amazon beginning and just used the Google ads for a while. I think I used the the seventy five dollars in credit, another fifty bucks or so, and then I just paused it until I was making enough through other sources, and then I turn it back on again. Mm. So I think if I look at all my accounting, what I do at the end of the month is I track what sales came, you know, that converted from Amazon, uh, mm. and what sales came from, you know, Google ads or, uh, you know, other ads. And as long as I break even on those, I let it run again. If mm -hmm. I don't break even, then I pause it and try to figure out, okay, you know, maybe I have to lower my, my cost per click, maybe I have to write, you know, have better, conversion you know, optimization for that product um, but the reason why I'm okay with breaking even is I know a lot of people will click through an Amazon ad um, not buy that day but then come back to my site because either they bookmarked it or they just recognize the name or uh, uh, that ends up because Shopify doesn't do the best job keeping that that track you know mm -hmm. that tracking cooking on mm -hmm. so a lot of times when something's you know a customer comes directly it's not they magically came directly from nowhere yeah. they just they remembered your site from somewhere they emailed it to themselves or made a note of it yeah that's interesting i definitely like i told you before the podcast the first niche and keywords that i went after weren't so great so that could definitely part of be be part of the reason why amazon didn't convert so well for me i know um 
Brendan Tully, who's also involved in the community here in Chiang Mai, has done well in his very niche market with Amazon ads. So as is the case with everything else, you just got to test it. Yeah. And, you know, what's nice is there's so many different ways where you can start getting traffic later on. But I said in the beginning, I was recommending people just pay for the traffic. Um, yeah. That's a whole nother conversation for another day. Yeah. But um, yeah, one of one of the reasons I'm moving away from SEO has just become harder to get fast results on brand new sites. There's supposedly some kind of waiting period for brand new sites, especially for high volume keywords. Um, and time really is money. You know, if you're just constantly waiting for that SEO traffic and waiting for that slow trickle to come in, it's going to take you a while to get statistically relevant kind of conversion and sales numbers. Um, whereas if you pay for it, you know, you might be losing money right away, but you send 50 or a hundred clicks at a time, you can start optimizing your store extremely fast um, with the sales copy and conversions, especially if you're focused on a single product line and you can send that traffic to a category page or something. So, um, yeah, maybe we can have a marketing, a deep marketing conversation another day. That would be interesting. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, what, one thing I actually noticed recently uh, is I'm beginning a lot more organic traffic to my stores. And I didn't realize it, it could be because Google updated again. And I don't even pay attention to this stuff because I don't do any, you know, I don't do any link building. I don't have a private blog network. I don't mm -hmm. have, I don't do any SEO stuff. I have on page SEO, uh, which is basically just unique descriptions. You know, good, I try to have good content, things like that. And the other thing um, is ever since Larissa quit her job uh, and started working with me in the mornings, she basically spent the first couple of weeks rewriting every single one of my product descriptions uniquely. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, it, I, it's hard to track exactly because you know, that could have came from anywhere, but I'm pretty confident there is a correlation of, of her rewriting all my all my descriptions um, organically. And I mean, um, you know, yeah, basically rewrite all my descriptions and me getting more organic sales. 100%. I, I would guarantee that that's where your traffic is coming from. It's pretty much the easiest way to get wins in e-commerce is to go above and beyond what your competitors are doing with their on-page SEO. In the market that I'm looking into, um, Amazon and Walmart do pop up for some of these products and like Lowe's and Sears. But when I go through and look, um, the people that aren't one of these mega brands, just regular drop shippers or whatever, they'll have maybe a hundred words of unique content. So I just know that by optimizing, you know, putting the keywords and brand name and SKUs in the URL and the title, and then putting 300 words of unique content, um, along with this fast hosting and stuff, my on page is just going to be light years ahead of what they're doing. So for any store owner, that's the easiest way to get that organic traffic is just go above and beyond your competitors with the on page stuff. So here's a question. So let's say someone's just starting out and they don't want to spend all that time writing all this content. They, they don't, they haven't really tested the products yet. Can they just use the generic manufacturer descriptions to start out? And then is there going to be a penalty if they start out with that? And then later on rewrite the descriptions? It's not. Um, it's not a penalty in the sense that a penalty is when you actually get in trouble, uh, just using the manufacturer's description, you're going to have duplicate content, which just means you're not going to get any love. You're not going to get any high rankings. You're not going to get very much Google traffic, but you're not penalized. So yeah, if you do go back and change them at a later date, then you will get that benefit from it. But because you are using duplicate content, you're not going to get any search engine love, which means you're not going to get any traffic. So if you're doing it the lazy way, you're basically trading off that organic traffic, which means you're going to have to do pay-per-click. Okay. But is there... Okay. So let's say I, I, I've started two identical stores or in different niches, but let's say one store A, I started with unique descriptions uh, from the start mm -hmm. and store B, I started with uh, the stock manufacturer descriptions and then later changed to unique. Um after all the changes, will I be just as, you know, is, will my store be just as far as head as if I just did it unique in the, in the first place? No, uh, no, because store A, where you're doing unique product descriptions right off the bat, um, one thing I'm doing with the store that I'm launching is uh, dripping out the new products. So instead of uploading 50 products in one day, I'll just be uploading, you know, three per day. Because Google likes to see sites with unique content. It's not duplicate manufacturer stuff and sites that are updated on a frequent basis. So by updating with three or five products a day with unique descriptions, they're really just going to love on that site and get me a lot of uh, initial traffic. Whereas if you build out a whole store and then it, it gets indexed, 
and then just you start changing these product descriptions, you're not going to get any love from that momentum of uploading unique content on a consistent basis. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, yeah, that, that second store is not going to be in nearly the same position as the first one. Okay. Yeah, th- that definitely makes sense. And I think it's kind of, it's kind of hard because, you know, part of me wants to tell everyone, Hey, when you start your store, just do it completely a hundred percent right from the, from the get go. And I think that if you have the confidence and you know that you're in this for the long run, and you know, this all works, then you will spend that time. But I can also see it being, you know, very like it's, you know, very time-consuming, not knowing if it's going to work. Because even with using the stock manufacturer descriptions, it took me two months to get my store really up and running, and all the products up. And if I had to write them all individually, I mean, it would have taken me at least another month. Yeah, it takes a lot. Of, I mean, that's why I'm outsourcing it. I did it the first time around, and I saw that it works. I mean, I got to, I don't know, excuse me, maybe thirty or forty visitors per day relatively quickly. Because I was doing the you know the optimized URL title, unique product descriptions, so I know that it works. It's just a general. That's how Google is. It's just you know how it works. But um, you almost never get your first website right. You know you'll pick the wrong niche or whatever. So it's kind of a toss up. If you know if you're going to be depressed that you're not getting that traffic, maybe you should do it. Um, if you just want a learning experience and you don't plan on your first site really being a winner then it can save you a lot of time not doing that. Or if you have the money, just outsource it and then you kill two birds with one stone. So when you outsource it, do you have a native English speaker or are they, is it someone, do they need to be native English speaker? I have a company that I trust um, that does my content writing for me. They basically charge a dollar twenty per hundred words. So like six bucks for a 500 word article. So I emailed her a couple days ago and said, hey, if I send you 50 product URLs, can your guys write you know, 300 word descriptions for each one. And she said, yeah, just, you know, give us some guidance and whatnot. So I've had them write for me before they, um, I trust them that what they deliver will be sufficient because you're still, you still do use the manufacturer stuff because people want to see the dimensions of the product. They want to know, you know, what's on there. It's just going above and beyond and adding this unique content, you know, at the bottom of the page on top of all the manufacturer stuff. Okay. So you can still, you don't have to rewrite like, you know, like 21 pounds to 21, no, no. you know, pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Change like LBS to POU, you know, whatever. Yeah. No, nah. no, nah, you don't have to do it like that. But, um, yeah, this really is not meant to, you know, sell these people on the product It's strictly for the search engines. Okay. So, so. Google doesn't. Are you saying that they don't care if you copy and paste the, let's say the, um, the you know, the dimensions, the manufacturer description. They just want to see that you you're also adding unique content to that same page. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, the, Google knows how it goes. They knows how they know how it is. And something like twenty percent of the internet is duplicate content. So they have they have an allowance, and I'm sure they understand e-commerce in particular. But yeah, it's really just adding that extra value that the search engines care about. Okay. Well, those are great tips, man. Uh, so if anyone out there has a store that is converting and making sales, highly encourage you guys to take advantage of Chris's offer. Uh, if you guys missed this first, you know, two or three spots, uh, I'd still recommend using his services and testing it out. I mean, cause if you're already making money, let's say you're making, you know that you're making, uh, seven sales a week from one of your products, you know, why not have, let him rewrite your, your content. And if you could start making 10 sales a week consistently, you know, it worked. Yeah, hundred percent. I'd love to talk to you guys. I mean, just seeing, you know, twenty percent improvement, thirty percent improvement can make, uh, you know, you're doing a thousand a week in sales or four thousand a week, whatever. It can make a nice little boost in your revenue and profit. So, awesome, Chris. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. If you want to email Chris or check out his site, it's gonna be on the show notes of episode fifty three of the Travel Like a Boss podcast. Uh, make sure you check out my blog, johnnyfd.com, and on there you can kind of follow the journey of what I'm doing now. You can read the article about Amazon FBA and eBay dropshipping and all that stuff. So uh, Chris, peace out. Yes. Thank you for having me. Talk to you later. See you guys. Thank you for listening to the Travel Like a Boss podcast. If you want to hear more, including the bonus, how to choose the perfect niche episode, join our mailing list at travellikeabosspodcast.com. See you next week. And remember, if you want to travel like a boss, you need to be your own boss. So start your online business today and start living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of.